Good morning. Hey, just a quick um, housekeeping. Can somebody from this wing here, Emily or somebody, can you go on the empty seats and grab one of these for everybody in, just in your little wing? Empty seats, grab one of these. And same with over here. It's kind of important to the service. So maybe Bryn or somebody over there can just come up to some of these empty seats and grab just one of these scriptures for everybody over there. Sorry about that. Um, but we are going to refer to the passage frequently, and I want everybody to have one. Thanks. So it's always interesting to imagine what your audience is feeling and experience after a two-week holiday for many of us. Certainly a holiday for all of us, but two weeks for many of us um, as we sit here this morning. Certainly there's probably joy and rest for some of us. Mine was imposed by an illness, but it's rest nonetheless. And I can guarantee there's also sadness and grief and disappointment and probably some depression in the room as well. And whatever you bring, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad for each person that's here today. And I can also guarantee something, that no matter what you brought here today, there's another person in the room that could say, me too. Me too. Two of the greatest words I think we can ever hear. Um, I think it's what makes those few minutes before church and those few minutes in, after church out there when our kids are saying, can we go? I think it's what makes them so significant. It's just the sharing of our life and our story together. It's the privilege of doing church together. I had a lot of fun <clears throat> this week studying resolutions, thinking about preparing for this morning and um, how so many of us prepare for a new year. Actually, over three quarters of over 75% of us prepare for a new year by making a resolution. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. All resolutions kind of fall into one of four categories. Let's have a little fun at this, and guess what one of those categories might be? Diet. diet. Number two is diet. Exercise, diet, exercise. What else? <laughs> what did you say? Finance is number three. Saving not spending, having a plan, making more money. What else? Self-improvement, smoking. That's number one. Something in your life that you want to change to improve. Starting yeah, that would be, um, for some, possibly. <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody out there that could justify self-improvement through smoking. So we have self-improvement, weight, body, money. We're forgetting one. We're missing the last one. It's actually relationships. So it, it's just one of the top 10 resolutions. This is the funniest one I found, and this is true, top 10, is I'm going to fall in love this year. <laughs> I think that's an interesting resolution to make, seeing as it doesn't really depend on you. Um, so over half of us make them. This is a fascinating statistic. If you're in your 20s, you're twice as likely to actually do your resolution than those of us who are in our 50s and older. Now, I am going to make it my personal goal this year to turn that statistics on its head. Um, but you are much more likely to follow through. How many, of you, how many of us do you think make it one week with our resolution? 75%. But one quarter don't even make it a week. And by six months, the statistic is almost, it's less than half of us are keep going with that resolution. My favorite dieting advice for resolutions comes from famous and best-selling author Anne Lamott. She basically just says, don't do it, and here's why. <laughs> here's why, and I quote her. I know many of you are planning to start a diet. I used to start diets, too. I hated to mention this to my then therapist. She would cheerfully say, oh, that's great, honey. How much weight are you hoping to gain? <laughs> I got rid of her sorry ass, pardon the language. Nobody talks to me that way. Now when I decide to go on a diet, I say to myself, great, honey, how much weight are we hoping to gain? I was able to successfully put on weight on a, on a book tour recently by eating room service meals in a gobbly trance in 13 different hotels. That was exhilarating, to make myself feel like Jabba the Hutt. I can still get my jeans on for one reason. I have forgiving jeans. The world is too hard as it is without letting your pants have an opinion on how you're doing. I struggle with enough self-esteem issues without letting my genes get in on that act. 
By the same token, it feels good to be healthy. Some of you need to be under a doctor's care. None of you need to go to Jenny Craig. It won't work. Some of you need to get outside and walk for half an hour, half hour a day. I do love walking, so that's not a problem for me. But I have a serious sickness with sugar. If I start eating it, I can't stop. It turns out I, have, I don't have an off switch any more than I do with alcohol. Given a choice, I will eat candy corn and raisinets until the cows come home. And then those cows will be tense, bitter, because I will have gotten the lipstick on the straps of their feed bags. <laughs> but you crave what you, eat, what you eat. So if I go three or four days with no sugar, the craving is gone. That's not dieting. If you're allergic to peanuts, don't eat peanuts. So please join me in January in not starting a diet. It's really OK, though, if you have to or pray for an awakening around your body. It's OK to stop hitting the snooze button and pay attention to what makes you feel great about yourself one meal at a time. It's an inside job. If you're not OK with yourself at 185, you won't be OK at 150 or even 135. The self-respect and serenity you long for is not out there. It's, it's within. I hate that. I resent it more than I can say, but it's the truth." End quote. I think if we're all really honest, those statistics that I started with and the quote from Anne Lamott <clears throat> are both well-spoken. We kind of want the prize without all the effort. I went for a short, I'm running short distances these days, on one of the days I was feeling well over break this week, and I ran by this, and it stopped me in my tracks. And this is what it said. It's just this new place opening up in Taos, and grand opening. The only non-diet, non-invasive, pain-free way to lose inches and fat. The only thing it doesn't say is non-expensive, non free. <laughs> the only non-diet, non-invasive, pain-free. Isn't that how we all want to change? Give it to me, but don't touch my body. Make me eat any differently or have me experience any pain. I'll take that kind of transformation. It's just simply not true. Transformation. It's what we all long for, change. It's why we do resolutions. We want to be different. I have a good friend who continually challenges me on why is change so hard for the Christian? Why are these habits of anger, pride, lust, spending money, why is it just so difficult to not say, I'm going to be different. I'm going to ask God for his help, and I'm going to change. And things linger. Ephesians 1 today actually speaks a lot about transformation in a profound way. And like so much of sacred scripture, an initial reading of it is kind of like this. We, we heard a little bit of it today. We're going to read, read it again and again. And it, but an initial reading makes you just sort of go, oh, that's so nice, that's so religious, these words are beautiful and powerful. But if you peel back the onion a little bit, it's like this diamond of a gem for us this morning, this gift. Uh, Lloyd, Jones, Lloyd Jones, what a hard name to say, says this about Romans chapter 1. If Romans is, the, I mean, about Ephesians, sorry, chapter 1. If Romans is the purest expression of the gospel, that was a quote from Martin Luther, then Ephesians is the most sublime and majestic expression of the gospel itself. It is difficult to speak of Ephesians chapter 1 in a controlled manner because of its greatness. So grab it out, and we are going to read it together, and I'm going to have you stand to read Ephesians. So we are going to read from verses 3 all the way down through verse 14, and this was actually in the Greek one sentence. You never wrote a sentence this long until, unless you were trying to make a very powerful statement. So let's read Ephesians chapter 1, one sentence, verse 3 to 14, together this morning. Who we are in Christ. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world be holy and blameless before him in love, destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have the redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. 
thou wis and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. For the fullness of time, gather up all things in him and things on earth. In Christ we have obtained inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. And you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, remarked with the promise of the Holy Spirit, that is the pledge of our inheritance through the redemption of God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Beautiful. Let's pray. You may have a seat. I'm going to pray. Father, your word is powerful. What we just read sums up timeless truth from the beginning of time throughout all eternity. Those words are true. And they represent truths that if we understand them and believe in them, have the potential of changing our lives now and forever. And so we thank you. I pray just in the next few minutes you would give us each individually a personal insight and understanding through your spirit of the reality of those words. Amen. Unlike other books and letters, Paul wrote this Ephesians. He wrote it from prison. Normally we stand up here and we tell you Paul wrote this letter to Colossians and here's all the problems that was going on in the church and he's addressing. He's not addressing any problems for the Ephesians. That's what makes this a fun thing to study because what he's doing is just laying out. He's just laying out the doctrine of Christianity in a letter. He's sending it to Ephesus, but it's not just intended to end there. What they did is scribes would copy the letter and it would just go all over basically the Middle East. So Ephesus was the first to receive this, but it's just this letter to say, this is, I'm in prison. I spent this time with Jesus. He died. He rose. I saw him. I'm an apostle. I've had a few years of spreading this message. And if I could distill down what I understand of Christianity, here it is in one sentence, in 11 verses, here it is. This is who Jesus is. It's, and it's packed. It's packed with things. It, it, many commentators would call this a eulogy, not in the sense of what you would speak at a funeral, but a eulogy to say this is an important speech and blessing on someone's life. It, and over and over in these 11 verses, does he, he says praise is just the natural result. You, you learn this about Christ and you praise him. You learn this. It's like there's a benefactor. He's giving his recipient something. And our response is the only response in, the, in, in here of ours is I praise him. I thank him. Like on Christmas morning, you were the recipient of a benefactor's good gifts. I hope everybody at least got one gift on Christmas. And you thank him. You, you open it up, and what's the first thing you do? And if they're a little child and they don't naturally do it, you, you say, thanks, thank Aunt Sally for that, because that's what we do. It's, it's natural. Nobody has to tell you. It's just a natural thing. We're going to learn two things about transformation, about true change, real change from these passages, two. One is that transformation is birthed. It is birthed in an understanding of who I am in him. Over and over in this passage, it's in Christ, in him, these things are true. So transformation takes place in an understanding of who I am in him. Secondly, to know who I am in him, I have to know who I am. Funny little way of saying it. But to know who we are in Christ, we have to start with a knowledge of who we are. From the opening verse, blessed be God our Father, right there, verse 3, blessed be God our Father, Paul is framing for Jews and Gentiles all over Ephesus and beyond, he's framing the mission and understanding of who Christ is in a Jewish understanding. So just that little phrase, blessed be God our Father. 
If you went to a Passover meal today at a Jewish friend's home, they would say this prayer over and over throughout the meal, that by the end of the Passover meal, this would happen today, you could do this if you have any friends, and I highly recommend you doing it. By the end of the meal, you would have that phrase memorized. Blessed be God our Father, they say it so much. So Paul's saying, blessed be God our Father, You've been, you know this prayer, you know this opening to a prayer, but I'm gonna reframe it, because it's in Christ. It's in and through Christ that this is true. So he starts from the onset. He's honoring the Jewish heritage of his Jewish listeners. And for his Gentile listeners, he's reframing the story. He's saying Christ fits into the Jewish story. And I'm going to honor it, and I'm going to frame it for you. Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So this is written about 60 A.D., up until about 30 years prior to this being written, that, that language had not been around, every spiritual blessing. Every blessing from God up until 30 years prior to this was conditional and partial. It wasn't complete. It wasn't infinite. But Christ changed the entire demograph, changed the whole story. Everything is available to us, and through us. In a sense, we are able to then pass that on. Every spiritual blessing at this moment in time and in 60 AD was available. Not so much prior to that. That's amazing. And and if you think about it was framed in the blessing of Jacob, the, the Jewish mindset and understanding, and even the Gentile mindset and understanding, would have an understanding of the blessing of Joseph to Jacob. It's a one time, it's a passed on through a generation. It's dependent on the family you're born in. It's not available to all. It's now modified. This blessing now exalts Christ as the definitive and abounding source of blessing. How do we know this from this passage? I'm just gonna take a simple look at it. Like, obviously, we could spend, we could spend the whole year studying this passage. We could, as a church, but we're going to do it in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> How do we know this? We're going to take a little further look at this passage. What does this passage tells us? I'm just going to go through a list. What, what comes to us from the Father through Christ? From the Father through Christ, this is what comes true to us, from, according to this passage. We're chosen. We're chosen. We are destined to become holy and blameless. This was done by Christ in love. So we were chosen to be holy and blameless. Those words holy and blameless, those used to be the words for the sacrificial lamb that each year had to be sacrificed for the people's sin. And now they're saying that's what we are. What a What a beautiful saying. We're the ones, and we don't have to be sacrificed because someone did it on our behalf. We are holy and blameless. We're destined for adoption through Christ. In him we have redemption. We'll take apart a couple of these words. God made known to us the mystery of his will. According to these passages, if Christ hadn't come, God's will would have remained hidden forever. But through Christ, the mystery of his will has been made known. In Christ, in him, we've obtained an inheritance. And because of that, we have access to all of the kingdom of God, all of life in his kingdom. We've been marked with a seal, the promise of an immediate redemption, a future redemption. It points to the immediate and the future. Transformation is birthed in an understanding of who I am in him. Remember a few weeks ago at the beginning of Advent, we talked about if we could only see God for who he was, we'd be changed? This is who he is. And these things change us. These verses mention that we're adopted. I know some of you in this room are adopted. Some of you in this room have, been adop- have adopted children. 
I'm not gonna go into great detail about adoption, but one thing that's true of adoption, there was a day that you weren't a member of that family. There was a moment in time that you weren't. And in a moment, all the rights, all the privileges, and all the ownership of that family became yours. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, I'm maybe a little bit of a Christian, I might be, last week I was a Christian, this week I'm not so sure, this, this passage is telling us that can't be. You're adopted. If you have spoken and uttered the words of faith in Christ, you have been adopted into his family. You, nothing can change that. It's a powerful truth that we are adopted in his family. Don't pass it over just because we've heard it a lot. Redemption. Again, the same thing that God did for the nation of Israel in freeing the slaves when they were slaves in Egypt, same word. Redemption just means to free a slave, redeemed. Somebody's paid the price. That's what he's done for us. It has a past meaning for Israel. It has a present meaning in our life. We have been freed from the chains and the result of of sin in our life. And, our, and it also has a future meaning. We have an ultimate redemption coming where we will be completely free. If you pick up at, in verse 6, 12, and 14, that's, those are the verses where at the end of those it says, to the praise of his glory, that just when you hear and understand these things, you go, thank you, thank you. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to ask you to, whatever posture you need to take, close your eyes, open your eyes, stand up, kneel, go like this, whatever you need to do to let this word sink into you, I want you to do that. I have a picture of me when I was 12 years old. I think we were camping with my family, and I'm like this in the forest. and I'm constantly trying to get back to that part of me that's just not afraid. Don't be afraid. Who we are in Christ. Blessed be God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him in heaven and on earth. In Christ we've also obtained an an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. I don't know what the reading of this does to you. I don't know if if you're anything like what Paul says we would naturally be moved to do. I don't know if you naturally are moved by this to say thank you. And I say that to say if you're not, it's okay. I've sat in this church for a year and a half like many of you. Some of you, this might be your very first week. But over and over we say these things about how loved we are and what a difference it should make in our life. And I've sat there like you and said, I don't feel it. It's not happening in my life. There's something about salvation, that's what this is talking about, these 11 verses, that beckons us that we have to admit our need. We don't need crutches if we don't know our leg is broken. In the same way, we're not often moved or changed or transformed by these radical truths of who a Savior is if we don't think we need salvation from anything. So transformation takes place in an understanding of who I am in Him 
But the second point that I want to make today is transformation takes place when I understand who I am. To know who I am in him, I must embrace who I am. Many of you, because you're probably one of the 18 million people who have viewed her TED Talk, know the name Brene Brown. Her TED Talk has been viewed by 18 million people and is now available in 49 languages, so I'm guessing the woman has something to say about something. For 10 years, she studied just shame. She's a shame researcher and a great storyteller. She studied the effects of shame on the human personality, and her research is riveting, I believe, because we all connect so much with shame. Obviously, there's a connection if we're all, I'm not good enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not talented enough. Those are a little bit of places where we could find shame in our life. For six years, she looked at, um, at, at she, she did all this research for four years and kind of discovered that there's people, we've all had experiences of shame in our life all of us, but that certain people kind of ride through them, and she'd call those people wholehearted. So after four years, she kind of thought, what's the difference between the wholehearted people, the people that get through it, that can kind of be honest with who they are and love well as a result of it? And what's the difference between those and the ones that are stuck? Six years it took her to kind of, and this is what she came out with. Wholehearted folks are the ones that have the courage to tell the story of who they really are. Wholehearted people have the courage to tell the story of who they really are. I love the way she puts it. She kind of says, who you're meant to be and who you really are is this big gap. And wholehearted people are the ones to go, here's my gap. It actually tells us a lot about transformation, if that's the truth. If wholehearted people are the ones who are really willing to say, this is who I am, who I really am. Because then we can go to Ephesians 1 with that understanding. If this is who I really am, I really do need a savior. If every one of us in this room would be honest with, this is who I really am, if that's what we talk about in the lobby before and after church, we would be so excited about the answers the scripture today provide us with, because we need a savior. An honest look at the connection between who I am and who I should be. If I could draw a picture for you, I would write Ephesians chapter one in between that gap. So this, um, these truths became real for me a number of years ago, 25 or so. And it was when I was faced with, am I going to be honest about some things in my life? And I'm going to tell you a story that I told in a therapy office 25 years ago. And when I told the story, which was just the first 10 or 15 minutes of the therapy session, the therapist said, I think we're done now. I just, I, I couldn't go on. I couldn't say anymore. He knew that I couldn't do anymore, say anymore for that day. So this is the story. Long before Taco Bell had a fourth meal, my family had the fourth meal going on growing up. We loved, I grew up, you know this if you've heard me talk, we grew up in a home that food was very important and beautiful thing, and we ate together all the time. So my parents, um, if we ever had a really good dinner, like at midnight that same day, let's say it was a turkey or a ham or whatever, prime rib, at midnight we'd all have sandwiches together because you're just kind of getting hungry again. We were all night owls in my family. So my, I was in high school, I had, worked, came home, and was going to go out with my friends. My parents had been out for the evening, and they were home, and so we're kind of intersected in the kitchen, making roast beef sandwiches, um, which, anyway, I won't go into that, but um, making roast beef sandwiches. So we're all, like, my dad was toasting the toast, my mom was doing something, I'm slicing the prime rib. It was just delightful, and my dad started to say some things, and I'd never heard the things that he started to say, and they just touch this part of my soul that I can't even describe, and this is what he started to say. I, at the time, was volunteering with um, some kids with disabilities, and he just said, Sarah, I just, I love what you do with these kids with disabilities. It's powerful. I love you. I, I had never heard my dad say, I love you, so I was, just wanted to sit in it. I just wanted to take it in, and then he goes, and it, but if you, if, <laughs> he was opening the manager's yard, and he goes, but if you can't, if you cannot stop not putting the lid right on the mayonnaise jar in the refrigerator. 
because I always left the jars undone. I just always, it was just like an ADD thing or something, but they were, I would like use A1 and leave the jar half open, and it just upset him. So it was like, I heard these words that I was meant to hear my whole life for the first time at 17, and I was like, oh, it feels so good. And then I heard it in the context of a mayonnaise jar lid. And it just was so, um, I just didn't know what to do with it. I never told that story to anybody. Anybody, not my husband, not, my, no, not a friend, until a therapy office 10 years later, seven, eight years later. Because it just touched this vulnerable place in me of, I, I think I was created for more. See, our, our, the young children in here don't understand what I'm saying because you've grown up, most of you, are growing up in homes where you hear this, one of my kids said to me over Christmas, you're saying it too much. <laughs> you know, like, do you know how loved you are today? Do you, know, you know, but many of us in my generation and beyond did not hear these words growing up. And there's these big gaps, these big vulnerable gaps in our lives, big. And so at best, at best, the way we were loved, our being loved, is at best a whisper of the symphony to come. It's just a whisper. It's like this taint little voice. But at worst, at worst, those stories like the one I just told, the vulnerable ones, it's a megaphone to us to say this isn't what it's meant to be. There's more. So where does transformation come in with our vulnerability? We take that. After I told that story in the therapist's office, Guess what happened to scripture in my life? <clears throat> it mattered. It mattered. My most significant encounter with God in front of a fireplace, I can't remember marble, I can't remember our address in Champaign. In Champaign, Illinois, happened within a week after telling that story because I, I was broken. I needed a savior. I was in need of salvation. Tell your story. The most wholehearted people are the ones willing to tell their story. I, um, I've been to seminary. I loved it. I learned a lot. But I still study scripture the way I did, I was taught to when I was in my early 20s. I look at a passage, and I just do these funny little things that I was taught early on. One thing I was taught was break it down. What, what is God what, what's God's part in this passage, and what's mine? So I did that with this passage this week. What's God's part? Do it. I, if, you, if you're old enough to read, you can do this. You can take this home, and 3 to 14, one sentence, you can write God's part, Sarah's part. God's part, Bryn's part. God's part, Mackenzie's part. This one, God's part. Sarah's part, one word, one word. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, and your love. One word, two words, love, faith, and love. You're knowing and you're going. I've heard of it. it all the rest is up to God. What a great thing to think of instead of resolutions this year. To just say, God, I want to come to you with my honest, vulnerable, real story. And I want to share that story with one or two other people in this room. Not the whole thing. I don't know if we could handle each other's whole stories. But a little bit of it. Just a little bit. Just today's. Just your Christmas. Just your holiday. I said to somebody in the lobby, how was your holiday? Not good. Thank you for being honest. Because I'll tell you, mine had some ups and downs. Thank you. I'm going to pray. And instead of a benediction, we're going to sing, Just Give Me Jesus. Ephesians 1. The birth, the life, the death of Christ, and what he offers in all of that is the greatest gift any of us could ever receive. Jesus, thank you. Thanks for making a difference in our life. Thanks for creating us 
not to be who we are at this moment, but to be who you created us to be. Thanks for the gap in that, because it makes us need you, know you, receive you. Thanks for Jesus. Just give us Jesus.